Hi, good evening everyone. This lecture is meant to develop an understanding of the basic mechanism of strabismus or squinting eyes amongst the general ophthalmologists as well as patients with this problem. Generally, it is wrongly assumed that squinting of an eye is a muscular problem and a simple muscle surgery will offer a long-term cure. But this is not the case. Most of these patients end up having two to three surgeries unnecessarily and still the eyes appear misaligned with a poor or reduced vision in the more squinting eye. Therefore, a proper understanding of this problem is very important. To develop an insight into strabismus, the concepts of three important phenomena will be discussed. Number one, the purpose and significance of binocularity, the concept of convergence, and the mechanism of amblyopia and its relevance in strabismus management. Binocularity is defined as the ability to focus upon an object with both eyes so as to create a single three-dimensional or a stereoscopic image. The three dimensions means appreciating the length height and depth of the object in view as is shown in the box. To understand binocularity, let's take the example from the animal kingdom. Grass-eating animals like deer, zebra, cow don't have to hunt for food as grass is readily available. They have eyes on either side of the face which gives them a 360 degree view of the surroundings so that while grazing they can detect an approaching predator from far away, thus having enough time to run. On the other hand, predators like lion, tiger, hawk have eyes on the front of their face and that gives them a precise vision to focus on the target, to appreciate the depth and distance from them so that they can adjust their speed of movement to catch their prey. Even in the bird kingdom, the situation is the same and the front placed eyes give the predators the perception of depth, contrast, assessment of distance and speed and relative motion. Similarly, we humans, we were born hunters. We were also blessed with a precise vision to hunt and to work. Therefore, binocular single vision is a blessing as it provides us with an assessment of depth distance, contrast, assessment of speed, and relative motion of objects. All these higher functions are necessary in professions like driving, flying, surgery, architecture, designing, painting. By not correcting vision in both eyes and restoring binocularity, we are denying all these important professions to our children and younger. The four important prerequisites for having a binocular single vision are eyes placed on the front of the face, having a clear visual axis in both eyes, equal vision in both eyes, and number four, the very important phenomenon of convergence. So what is convergence? When a baby is born, both eyeballs are lying divergent in the bony orbits as shown in figure A. As soon as the baby opens its eyes after birth to look at an object, for example a mother's face, signals from both eyes go to the convergence center in the brainstem reticular formation. And baby's eyes converge so that both eyes are focused on the same object. The closer the object is to the eyes, more is the effort of convergence. So from 23 degrees for far, it increases to about 60 degrees for near. An intact convergence at birth is extremely important for developing binocularity as it enables both eyes to look at the same object in space at all distances of gaze. The horizontal distance between the pupils of two eyes is called the interpupillary distance 
and in an adult it is 6 to 6.5 centimeters. So this results in the right eye seeing more on the right side of an object while the left eye sees more on the left side of the object. Thus two slightly dissimilar images arise from each eye and this separation of images from both eyes is called retinal disparity. Since both eyes are focused at the same object in space in the Panhand's fusion area as seen as figure C, the image is located at corresponding retinal areas of both eyes which are almost similar in size, sharpness and brightness. Therefore, they are fused in the brain and appreciated as one by the process of sensory fusion making us appreciate a three-dimensional image. This process of sensory fusion locks both eyes into alignment in all directions of gaze by signals arising from the sensory cortex and going to the motor areas of the brain. So convergence and sensory fusion are mandatory for developing motor locking system and motor alignment. It is important to remember that convergence is linked with accommodation in the brain and both are binocular phenomenon. The power to converge and accommodate to see near objects is maximum in young age but the amplitude decreases with increasing age as shown in the graph. Therefore, eyes develop a natural tendency to deviate outwards starting at mid-teens. These patients develop the symptoms of eye strain as they are mainly doing near work with one eye whilst the other eye is deviated outwards. This problem of an exophoria or an exotropia in the, starting in the mid-teens or 20s can be easily managed by doing convergence exercises and removing the plus or the hypermetropic glasses from such patients. In addition, prolonged near work exhausts the continuous effort at convergence and accommodation and further causes blurring of vision. The blur signal in turn results in axial enlargement of the eyeball and the development or progression of myopia stigmatism and squinting eyes. Therefore, taking a break after every 40 minutes of close work or reading and adopting a proper straight ahead posture while studying is extremely important to prevent strabismus as well as progression of myopia. An absence of convergence at birth results in uh, exotropia at birth or it, a too much convergence result in a child born with an isotropia, then a lack of convergence, lack of accommodation and prolonged exotropia can result in amblyopia and loss of binocularity. Coming on to the problem of amblyopia, if the two eyes are not aligned at birth as in a congenital isotropia or an exotropia, or if the misalignment occurs in childhood, both eyes see dissimilar images. In addition, if the baby is born with a refractive error in one eye, then image from that eye is more blurred. These dissimilar images cause confusion in the brain and the more blurred or dissimilar image is blocked by the brain the neural connections from that eye are actively suppressed by the brain, resulting in amblyopia in that eye, as shown in figure A. And if the strabismus or the squinting eye is not treated early, the angle of strabismus increases. Along with this, the image from that eye is suppressed more and more. The neural connections from that eye to the brain shrink and the amblyopia deepens. So any effort by the brain for that eye to see is lost and as amblyopia worsens, the ocular misalignment also worsens. 
and vice versa. If squint surgery is performed on an amblyopic eye without correcting its vision first, the ocular alignment will never occur in the absence of sensory fusion mechanism as I have already explained. The operated eye will not stay straight or aligned to the good eye as it is unable to see the same object as the good eye and that sensory locking system in involving the penance fusion area does not occur. Therefore, it will deviate again in the absence of the sensory as well as the motor locking system. To elaborate on this point a little bit more, the extraocular muscles maintain the primary gaze position and allow the eyes to follow moving objects by the smooth pursuit movements and accomplish rapid changes in fixation by the fast eye movements called saccades. This is accomplished by intricate neural connections between the visual system, the sensory and the motor cortex. All these connections from the amblyopic eye are suppressed while those from the good eye are facilitated. Ultimately, the good eye becomes the dominant eye and the brain perceives that it has only one eye while the amblyopic eye is totally ignored. If as the treating ophthalmologist you want to restore sight in an amblyopic eye, you have to remember the phenomenon of binocular rivalry and what is it? It is the suppression of blurred or very dissimilar image in the deviating eye along with abnormal binocular interactions between both eyes and the phenomenon of ocular dominance. That is, the neural connections from the good eye are dominant and image transmission from the good eye is favored over the amblyopic eye to the brain. So as long as good eye is occluded, neural transmission will occur from the bad eye. Without that, it will not happen. So to understand the rationale of amblyopia therapy, amblyopia management comprises of two important parts. Number one, to block the vision of the good eye. And number two, to stimulate the vision of the lazy eye. I'll try to explain this a little bit more. As demonstrated in this slide, neural transmission from the good eye to the brain is favored and facilitated. The three neural pathway from the amblyopic eye is broken and transmission through the brain is suppressed. Amblyopic eye will begin to see only once neural transmission from the good eye is blocked by an eye patch and as long as the patch is worn on the good eye and that eye is prevented from seeing, only then the neural trans transmission from the amblyopic eye occurs to the brain and its vision starts improving. But as soon as the patch is removed from the good eye, brain immediately favors the already well-developed and mature connections of the good eye while those of the lazy amblyopic eye are suppressed once again and they start breaking up. So any improvement in vision that had occurred while the patient was wearing an eye patch will be lost. This will happen daily in patients who wear an eye patch for only three to six hours every day. As a result, the net visual improvement achieved by part-time patching is only minimal. Only by wearing the eye patch full time for all waking hours and preventing the good eye to see, only then the amblyopic eye has a chance to improve its vision maximally. The second part of therapy is an active, strong stimulation of the amblyopic eye so that all neural connections with all parts of the brain are maximally stimulated. Please remember that amblyopia affects all parts of the brain. Only when the patient reads or writes, then the amblyopic eye 
while the good eye is blocked with an eye patch for at least five to six hours daily only then all parts of the brain are maximally stimulated and within two to three months of full-time patching and reading writing five to six hours daily the vision of the amblyopic eye is restored to its full capacity once this has been achieved and then strabismus surgery is performed the ocular alignment stays for the whole life of that patient i hope that's very so the important lessons that we've learned from this lecture are that convergence is a necessity for binocular single vision every attempt must be made to preserve it and to restore it convergence must not be weakened too much by recession of the medial rectus or by wearing a plus or hypermetropic correction after surgery or after the age of four to five years in children number two binocularity is a blessing and it maintains ocular alignment number three prolonged near work increases convergence and accommodation and therefore induces the blurring of vision and results in an increase in all refractive errors strabismus and convergence weakness the digital screens they are extremely harmful for the kids as the screen is held very close to the eyes and it emits harmful radiation um, most of the time children adopt bad postures to uh, wash the digital screens and this results in their progressive eye strain an increase in the number of glasses and induces blurring sig of vision and that blur signal again results in myopic progression so constant strabismus results in amblyopia so an eye must not be operated upon unless the amblyopia is corrected first and to correct amblyopia only full-time patching along with reading and writing for six hours daily restores excellent visual acuity in an amblyopic eye within two to three months so you must give it a try we have published all our research uh, at various times uh, in all these uh, peer-reviewed journals and uh, you can have a look and read more about amblyopia and its treat thanks very much for listening to this lecture if you have any queries you can post in the comments and I will try to answer them for appointments you can call these numbers thanks very much